um, I, I want to spend a little bit of time reviewing the concept, although I suspect that folks probably have a pretty good idea of the concept. And then we'll get into a couple examples and, and talk about really what, what you gain from it and, and what the wins are. All right. Um, inheritance is when, effectively, you base one class off of another class. You, you are said to extend the class. So you take a class as a starting point and then you extend that class for your new class. Sometimes when you're talking in abstract terms, they call that specialization. The idea is that the subclass, the class that is based upon the other class, is a more specialized version of the first class. For example, um, you could have a class for student. All right. And then you could have a subclass for in-county student, a subclass for out-of-county student, a subclass for out-of-state student, a subclass for international student, all of those being subclasses of the superclass of student. So we can have student. And then from that, we can have all these classes hanging off of, of this. Now, I don't know if this is the best example. We'll go over some other examples as well. The idea is this, whenever you have a, a, a subclass, superclass relationship. The idea is that they're all students, right? Um, and much of what you do with those students is the same, but there's some differences. Now those differences could mean additional attributes. There may be additional attributes. For example, for, uh, uh, you know, for an international student, let's say, there could be attributes concerning their, their country of origin, what their visa is, and all that in addition to all the other attributes that, that uh, um, all students share. There can be new methods. For example, in the international student, you could get the country of origin, get information about their visa, and so on. In addition, you can override methods. So, in this case, you might calculate tuition a different manner for out of county students than you would for um, other students. So that's kind of it from a perspective of business classes that what you gain from this is you gain a couple of different things. You gain reusability of code and you gain polymorphism. All right, Reusability of code means if there's a whole set of functions that students participate in, all right, that, that are functions and methods on the student. You don't have to identify them on each of the subclasses. You only identify those that are different. So, for example, calculating graduation fee, for example. I don't know, I'm just making stuff up, all right, but calculating graduation fee. That might not depend on what kind of student you are. All students might have the same calculation for that, in which case that function can live here, and you don't have to implement the function here, here, and here, and so on. Um, you only need to code the differences, in effect. You only need to code what makes that class special and distinct from the, the parent class. Uh, again, they call it specialization. The big test for inheritance is if you can make a case that the subclass is a, or is an example of, or is a kind of the superclass. Especially if that relationship is very strong. All right. We contrasted that with interfaces the other day where we said that we could um, use interfaces in the place of inheritance in some cases if the is a relationship wasn't particularly strong. And by particularly strong, I meant, you know, you don't normally in everyday life think of it, 
that way. Like a bird is more like an animal than it is like other flying things. So you might use bird as being a subclass of animal as opposed to bird being a subclass of some class called flying things. You might create a flying things interface because all flying things have a couple of things in common and you can put that code in an interface. All right. The polymorphism aspect is we can pass any kind of student to any function that requires a student. So, for example, if we had a method that was something like we had a degree class and Let's say there was a has met qualifications method in that degree class that returned a, uh, a Boolean, returned true or false. We could pass it a student. We could have as the argument a student. And we could then pass it any kind of student that we wanted. Any kind of student object. Because, in fact, it makes sense. An in-county student is a student. So if a student is required, an in-county student will do, an out-of-county student will do, and so on. So that's the polymorphism aspect when we get into one more thing. When we pass one of these objects in, if there's a, a method call, student calc tuition, let's say, it calls it on the appropriate class. In other words, it calls it on the one that that student actually is. So, for example, if there was a calculate student, or I'm sorry, calculate tuition method on all of the classes, and if we gave it one time an international student, one time an in county student, it would use the international student's calculate tuition method for the international student and the in county student's calculate tuition method for the in-county student. That's what we mean by polymorphism. We can give it that. We can declare that the argument is on this level, but it still uses the appropriate methods. What we can't do if the argument is student is we can't call methods that only exist on these subclass levels. All right, because you know, get country of origin, for example. Let's say that only international students have that method. Well, if we're passing a student in, we can't ask for a student's country of origin because not all students have that method. Only the international students do. Yes? Uh, let's say you have, have three levels of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. right? you know, a is a super mm -hmm. Right. Do you need to find that signature at what, at what level? Like, like for instance, if, 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 if the signature was at the B level, uh -huh. would I be able to use it by passing in the signature of the, at the A level of the hierarchy? Or would it only... Uh, All right. All right. I, 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 do you make that, that signature at the highest possible level? Well, let, let's talk about that. Uh, and, and let's consider, let's consider a, 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 real, um, a real class structure. All right. Let me, let me pause a second and think of one. Um, let's do the classic because everyone always does it. Uh, classic living thing. Um, plant, animal, then mammal, and so on. Let's do that one for four. Okay, yeah. Well, okay, yeah. We could do a lot of different ones. All right. <laughs> let's, uh, well, let's, let's go with student. Let's say student, and then we have Oh, well, we'll do this one. Student, 
undergrad, I'll try not to keep it too contrived, graduate, master's student, master's degree student, and PhD student. Okay, so we have, we have a, a three-level hierarchy. All right. Now the question is, if we were going to find a method, uh, where would we, where would we, if we were going to find a method on some class somewhere, what would we make the argument? Would we make it a student? Would we make it a undergraduate? Would we make it a graduate? Would we make it PhD or masters? And the qu the answer is, we make the one that makes sense. We make the one that's appropriate for that method. For example, um, get dissertation topic. What would we, what would we, um, what level would that be declared upon? Well, probably the PhD, yeah. Assuming that master's students don't really have a dissertation. PhD students have dissertations and no one else does. So if it was, if there was a tell me your dissertation topic, yeah, yeah, neither do I. Well, I know I never, I, have a, I know I never wrote a dissertation, so it must be on the PhD level, right? So if I had a method that said, you know, info, you know, get info, and I passed, and I was trying to decide what kind of student I was going to pass into this argument, uh, into this method, if this is on some class that we don't know about, but um, I would say. Um, if I had a get dissertation, only PhD students have dissertation, so I would have to give a PhD student to that. All right. If the method was say get previous get undergrad degree earned, or, or get undergrad degree, that I could declare it for a graduate student. Because both masters and PhD students would have presumably a a uh, uh, some undergrad degree. If I ask like get name, you know, and I pass that a student object, I could pass that a student object because all of those have it. So the question is: is you declare it where it makes sense to do it? All right. Um, We're going to talk about views in a second here. Um, go, go ahead. So, on the get undergrad, if I passed the student, would the get undergrad method still? No. No. What you'd get is you get a compile error. All right? Because. Yeah. Well, because, again, you've got to follow the is a test, right? If my, if my argument. If my function, if I have some function whose argument is a graduate student, can I pass it a student? Is a student a graduate student? No. Student is not a graduate student. I can't make that blanket statement. All right. Therefore, I couldn't call this function and pass it a student. student wouldn't necessarily have that method defined. Right. But I could pass that method a PhD student. Right. Because a PhD student is a graduate student. So if it requires a graduate student, well, a PhD student is certainly a graduate student. So therefore, a method that required a graduate, I could pass a PhD, but I couldn't pass student. And I definitely couldn't pass undergrad either. So. Well, well, keep in mind that, that I'm, 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 at this point I'm talking about at this point I'm talking about declaring methods not within these classes, but in some other classes accepting these guys as arguments. Yeah. Okay. So I'm saying, you know, get undergraduate if I call it from a PhD student, 
Right. Is a, yeah, as a graduate student, right, right. So again, this is a test, you know. If you're looking to see, um, if you're looking to see can you pass an argument, a student is not an example of a graduate student. So it's not necessarily a graduate student. So I can't pass a student when a graduate student's expected. I can do the reverse, though. If my argument took a student, if I had some function, that took as an argument a student, I could give it a undergrad, because an undergrad is a student. I could give it a graduate student. I could give it a PhD student. I could give it a master's student. All right? But it doesn't work the other way. In other words, you can pass a class's subclasses in place of it. You can't pass a class's super class in place of it. So if it's expecting a graduate student, I can't give it a student. But if it's expecting a student, I can give it a graduate student. All right? And wherever that, lie, wherever that function is defined, all right, it, or rather, if this function makes calls to that class, it's going to get the functions on the proper level. And again, that's the, that's the polymorphic part of it. All right. I, I thought maybe there was someone at the door or something. Uh, pay attention. Uh, all right. Anyhow, um, so again, continuing this example, If we had, let's say, a different method for cal calculating tuition for graduate students than for undergrads, we could have a calc tuition here and a calc tuition here. All right? Our function, our bursar's function, that was, you know, something like schedule dot calc tuition and we passed it a student, if we passed it a graduate student, it would call the calc method on that to calculate like the amount per credit hour. And if we pass it an undergrad, it would, a calc, it would pull the, uh, the tuition from the undergrads. And again, that's, that's the whole business of polymorphism. So, in reality, we're using it all the time, right, because we're using views and we treat things as views, for example, on like the, the uh, gesture uh, manipulation. We know that a view got touched, for example. We don't know what, we don't necessarily care what kind of view it is, but we know that it's a view and we can handle it that way. So we can call all view methods on that argument in that because, again, the argument that gets passed into that method, the, the on touch or, or one of those, is, is a view the view that got uh, touched. All right. Now, in practice, we use inheritance for two different things. And is, they're really the same thing. It's just, it's, in my mind, it's sort of a, a, a matter of perspective. All right. The, the Android platform defines certain things in the framework. If there's something that we want to do, especially if it's something we want to do often, that's not in the framework, we can extend the framework. We can build our own component based on the stuff that's already in the Android uh, framework. So essentially, we're, we're, we're taking and, and we're ramping up their components we're, to do something specialized just for our business. Hey, they can't do everything for us, right? So they've given us a set of building blocks that are, that are common to all sorts of applications. But if we have some sort of need distinct from that, we can build our own view, for example, that uh, does the things that we want it to do. All right? And then we have a component that we can use in our application. All right? And we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. We get all the great benefits of doing a, a component. The other 
case of inheritance is doing something along these lines where we're implementing business logic. All right, where we have a case of there's students, yeah, but there's different kind of students, and they're treated sort of the same, but they're treated sort of different, and so on and so forth. And then we override methods as, as needed. We add additional methods and additional attributes and so on. All right? So I have an example of each of these. What I've done is I've, I've, I've made two examples today. Uh, the first one I suspect will take longer, so we'll cover that one first. The second one's probably a bit more straightforward, not all that exciting, uh, so we'll cover that one second. And the first one is where we're going to extend something in the Android framework. All right. Let's imagine that I am a photographer. All right. And I take great pictures. All right. And I'm proud of my pictures. Well, I don't want someone screenshotting my pictures and passing it off as their own. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to watermark them, right? I'm going to put something on it. And you, we've all seen this, right? In, in, uh, if you've been to, to sites that feature photos or, or for photographers, be something like a copyright message, you know, that appears sort of faded on top of the image, all right? And we probably don't want to do that for a photographer for one image, right? We probably want to do that for all of them, all right? So what could we do? Well, we could figure out something. We, 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 here's, here's our choices. I could go in, and for every image that I have, I could go into Photoshop or whatever and manually edit a, uh, and already we're saying no way, right? That's too much work, all right? So no, we're not going to do that. The other thing I could do is I could just have the one copy of the image, but I could programmatically go in and for every image go and do that. Well, that sounds a little better, right? Except for the fact that I don't want to do it for every single image on my page. Write some code that's going to go and put my watermark over top of it. So what's the answer? The answer is I'm going to create a new view that is an image with a watermark. All right? So I'm going to extend the image view, because the image view is most of what I want, right? The attributes of an image view are most of the attributes I want. All my new watermark image is, is the image view plus a little something, plus a little alteration to slap a, 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 a watermark on it, all right? So that's all I want to do. I just want to add that one thing. The image view is perfect, except it doesn't give me the facility to do a watermark. So I'm going to make a component that's going to take as a starting point the image view. Right? I'm not going to reinvent the wheel and make my own image, my own image view. You know, I'm going to take that as my starting point, and I'm going to add to it a watermark. All right? So that's our first example. And let me go and run it. And then we will look at the code that does it. These are, in fact, actual pictures I took. So it's not like I'm making it up and saying that. Is this how it's usually done? Is, is what? Um, I don't know. Yeah, there, there's, it sure can be done a lot of different ways. This was my clever solution uh, to do this. Again, because my thought is, is, yeah, my thought is is that I want to do this for all the images on my site. All right, so let's zoom in. And if you can see, you can probably see on this one better than that one. I played around with the size of it simply to demonstrate that, well, we might want to play around with the size. Typically what they do is they put the watermark somewhere where you can't crop it out, you know, somewhere over the interesting part of the picture, right? Because otherwise, like if I had the watermark down here, you'd just go crop it off and, and you'd be done with it. So you kind of put the, the watermark where the action is, right, <laughs> to, to interfere with it. All right. And now I did it twice just to show, hey, it's a component. I just didn't custom code one solution. All right. So let's go and let's look at this. And... 
What we're going to see is we're going to see that how I extended this, all right, and then we'll see how I can customize the watermark to appear different and look a little different through the use of the XML file, right? Because our XML file is what we use to give certain attributes to the image view, right? Well, we can continue to do that, right? Why? Because mine is an image view. So I can set all those properties of an image view because this is an image view. But it's a souped up image view. It's an image view that has some extra properties that I need to pass to it. So let's uh, go ahead. Let me ask you this. So, okay, it's an image view. Hmm? What if you set, I mean, what if you set the image view image? Mm -hmm. Would you have You could do this. You could do this a bunch of different ways. You could make a transparent image that said that if you wanted it to be a watermark. This is actually text. This is actually plain text that goes on top of it. But I could make an image, a little smiley face or something. I've seen those kind of things done, and I could do it. Um, the bigger question here is is how to make a component to do this because I don't want to manually whatever it is whatever I decide to do it I don't want to do it manually for a hundred images on a site. I want to do it once and and be done with it. All right, so let's look at the code. Maybe. There we go. All right. We're going to look at the layout. Now let's look at let's look at the let's look at the class first. Then we'll look at the layout. All right, my package information, um, my imports. All right, public class watermarked image extends Android widget image view. So I'm extending this. This is an image view, but it's my image view, and I've added some things to it. I have three extra properties. I have the watermark size. That's the text size of the watermark. If you notice. We have two different slightly, whoops, sorry. We have two slightly different text sizes, so I just played with setting the attribute. I also have an X and Y uh, attribute to say where I want it to appear on the picture. Again, this isn't elaborate, and this isn't the perfect watermarking solution, you know. You might want to do some kind of calculation of the size and whatever, but I, I, what, what my goal was for this is show how to pass attributes in from the XML file. So in a way it doesn't even matter what those attributes are, but okay, we'll, we'll go from there. All right, I then have some constructors. Three of them in fact. All right. That mimic the three constructors that are on the image view. Right? Why do I need to do that? It definitely will give me a compiler if you don't. How do how do constructors inherit? Oh yeah, well you gotta inherit whatever the uh, parent class, I guess. Kind of. Okay. Okay. Okay, you're all saying right statements, but I wanna I wanna get this a little more precise. Let's go back to constructors 101. If no constructor, then much like if you can't afford a lawyer, a constructor will be provided for you. All right. So if there's no constructor in your class, the compiler provides a constructor. All right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Now, second piece of this is 
constructors don't inherit. Okay? So constructors are not, they're method-like, but they're not truly methods in, in the sense that they don't inherit. So the fact that I have constructors defined on the superclass, that doesn't mean beans on the subclass. All right, those are not defined at all. Now, the superclass has to be constructed before the subclass can be constructed. All right? So, super has to be constructed, then the subclass can be constructed. So, let's imagine I have, in my watermark, I have no constructors. Okay, I'm not going to inherit them from the image view, right, because constructors don't inherit. If I have no constructor in the watermark, it's going to generate a no argument constructor. Then no argument constructor has to call the supers constructor, right? Has to call the superclass because the superclass has to be created before the subclass be, can be created. Since this is the, the constructor that's being inserted, I'm not explicitly stating which constructor on the superclass I want to call. So if you don't explicitly state what super constructor you want to you want to call, what gets called? the no argument constructor on the superclass. Well, image view doesn't have a no argument constructor. So, if I don't define any constructors on here, I will get an error because the image view has no no argument constructor. There's three constructors on this. One that takes one argument, I think, two arguments, and three arguments. But there is no no argument constructor. And that will be a compile error. So if I have no constructors, in fact I can do that real quick. Well, well, let's talk about that in in a second. Let's 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 see what happens if I don't have any constructors. If I don't have any constructors and I try to compile this guy, Android already knows something's wrong. <laughs> so let's go and try to run this. Yep. Okay, I got errors. Let's go and view those errors. And We can look and see that that says that, oh, implicit super constructor image view no argument is undefined. So I must define an explicit constructor. All right. In other words, I didn't define any constructor, so this class gets the implicit constructor that's provided to it by the compiler. It still needs to call the super class first, right? And what's it going to call on the superclass? Well, that implicit constructor doesn't know what to call on the superclass, so it's going to call the no argument constructor on it. All right? So therefore, since there is no no argument constructor on the image view, then um, I'm in trouble. All right. So what am I going to do? Yeah, I'm going to undo that, and I'm going to call all of the constructors on the image view. Now, again, I impl implemented all of them and I think that's probably a good idea because if the image view can get instantiated with each of those constructors, then my guy probably can get instantiated depending on, on how I instantiate it. So I better have myself covered. All right. So, all of them, if I didn't have super in here, what would it call? Since I didn't explicitly say, it would try to call the no argument constructor on image view. Oh, it's going to call one regardless. Exactly. So if I comment this line out, 
again, I'm going to get that same sort of compile there. Nope. Nope. Implicit superconstructor image view, no argument is undefined. Doesn't know. The, the idea is kind of like this. When you start defining constructors, the compiler says, you got this one? Good. I'm going to go take a nap. You got these constructors handled? I'm not going to interfere in any way. So if you don't do anything, it does that for you, but it does it for you in a very simplistic sort of way. All right, and it, it calls the no argument once. Once you start defining constructors, it says, hey, you got this handled, I ain't getting involved. All right? So, yeah. All of these, the first line is simply to call the super and give it up the same arguments, um, which it has to do. Now, I have this in here, which we'll come to. Th this function relates to pulling out of the XML file the attributes that are distinct to the watermark view, all right, and, and setting my object. So, so that's what these do. That's kind of, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that in a few minutes, but that's in, a, in essence what that does. They're not related to the, right. the uh, class variables. No, these are related to my class variables, all right. In other words, these attributes that I'm initializing here are attributes of my guy, not of the image view. But there are two places then? Because you're, 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 you're assigning them, you're assigning values to them? You find them in the class, and then you're also passing values in from the XML? Yeah, that, that's how I do with everything else, right? Forget about my, my guy. Let's just look at it, let's just talk about an image view. All right, does this have an image view? No, no, it doesn't, but it has other views. So let's look. Let's look at my other example, the tip calculator. Exactly. In other words, if I look at this, I have a spinner control. All right. What do you think these guys are? These guys are all attributes of this class. All right. I am just initializing them through my XML file. Um, putting these in an XML file is sort of like freeze drying them, right? It brings that in, and they even say it inflates it to create the actual objects. This is kind of saving the object data that we want. Yeah, go ahead. From our last mm -hmm. discussion, the map, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't actually uh, follow exactly what you're saying, but I think the answer is yes. Let's talk about what's going on here. This is our tip calculator that we did weeks ago. All right? This is my layout. This layout says, hey, here are the objects that I want to have in this, in this guy, you know, in, in, in this layout. I want to have a text view, and here are some of the attributes of it. I want to have an edit text field, and here are some of the attributes. I want to have a spinner control, and here are some of the attributes, and so on down the line. Now, when we bring this in, set content view our layout main, effectively what we're doing is we're taking that XML file, sucking it in, and we're actually making those objects for our view, the content view for this. So now there is a text view object and an edit text object and a spinner object and all those objects that were in the XML file. That's actually creating, That's actually creating the objects. What are we doing here? 
We're simply grabbing pointers to those objects. So those objects get created by, like for example, this creates all those objects. This is simply finding the button that got created by virtue of being defined in the XML file. So if you want to look at it, this layout XML file is simply a description of the objects it's going to create and the different properties of them. All right? When we want to be created with initially, right? Because we could go in dynamically and change that. If you remember the hide the flag game, um, the the button originally said hide the flag, then it said show the flag or something like that. So yeah, we could change it just like we can change attributes on any object, right? But yeah, those are the values that get initialized. Now you don't see those things defined because we haven't made up the text view. That's part of the framework, right? We didn't make up the class text view, right? Someone else did. So we don't see all those attributes. Here in my custom view, since I'm the one making it up, we see those instance variables for it. In other words, these three things are properties that are going to be set from the XML. It absolutely is inflated via the content. Well, we haven't seen it do it yet, but it, it will. It, it does, and it will. These are initial values. These are just values that I created to initialize it. And then we're going to go and we're going to bring in the values from the XML. I want to actually talk about something else first, then we can come back to this. Although actually, since we're talking about this, we might as well continue, as opposed to going back and forth. So, those attributes I just initialize, right? Because, keep in mind, I might not have uh, attributes in the XML file for those. You know, it's possible not to have those. Now, Let's look at the XML file in this example. In the XML file, in this example, yeah, right. oh, it's, it's down below the air log. I guess we every single time. All right. Now, this gets a little tricky. So, all right. Here I'm creating a namespace. All right. What's a namespace? Does anyone have a definition of a namespace? Um. Yeah, kind of. It, namespace is really a way of like qualifying what we're talking about. So, for example, by an amazing coincidence, there could be something called watermark image view in the Android framework. All right, and I just I just forgot to look it up. <laughs> All right. All right. So. If I refer to a name, I have to sort of qualify it. And I give it a namespace to say, in this universe, I'm using this universe's class. So, for example, I've defined the Android namespace, all right, for these things. All right. These things relate to Android properties from the Android world, from the Android universe. This MZ one relates to a namespace. And again, that isn't really the URL of a page. It just uses an identifier. This effectively says things that are prefixed with MZ, you know, there might be an X and Y in the Android namespace. But we're not talking about Android's X and Y. We're talking about my X and Y. All right? 
So I qualify these attributes with the namespace just in case there's an Android thing that has the same name. All right. So we're not talking about Androids X and Y. We're talking about Mike's X and, X and Y. We're not talking about Androids watermark side. We're, size. we're talking about mine. So, notice I have this. This is the syntax that we saw the other day. All right. Where I put in the, the object name qualified by the package that this is going to create. Just like this is the Android object that this is going to create. We don't see that source code because it's part of the framework. But here, this is the Android object that's going to get created. This is the Android object that is going to get created. And these are my attributes that I want to pass in when this gets created. Now, I have to specify, that was frightening, I have to specify what are legal attributes, all right, for this object. Because, if I go in and do something like this, at some point, anyhow, it's going to know that's not a legitimate attribute. All right, maybe, maybe when I compile it. All right. So I have to somehow identify what's a legit attribute in my universe. The Android ones are predefined, right? I have to say, I have to define my universe and what attributes I'm going to pass in for these classes. So if I look in this values folder, I have an attributes XML. And what this says is, these are the attributes that I can pass to my guy, all right? Declare stylable watermark image view. So I can pass some characteristics to my watermarked image view. What can I pass? I can pass X and Y that are integers and watermark size as an integer. So I've defined here what like the legal things I can pass to it are. All right. So that's two of the three pieces that we need to actually make this happen. All right. First thing we need to do is we need to declare my namespace so it doesn't like think it's coming from the Android world because the Android world doesn't know about watermark sizes and the Android world may very, de may very well have a different meaning for X and Y than my meaning for X and Y. So I have to declare in my layout file a namespace and say these properties, these are my properties, these aren't Android standard properties. I have to go in and create an attributes XML file to say, yeah, indeed, these are the properties that are valid for my particular object. Like a schema, like a schema right. That's a standard syntax. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. You name it I believe so, yeah. All right. Then lastly, if you notice in my constructors, I call, if I'm getting a contact, context and attributes, I call set attributes, which calls this guy. And this guy effectively goes in, yanks out the attributes from the context attributes that are relevant to this guy, all right, relevant to this class. And then I set the watermark size to and I use that syntax. This syntax R stylable means it's something that's in the attributes file. All right. Watermark image view is the class name. Underscore watermark size is the attribute name. The second field uh, is a value if, it, if, if those attributes aren't present. So for example, if, if I didn't set the, the, the uh, watermark size for a particular um, one in the XML, um, it would give it a value of 10. And likewise, I yank the X and Y. So this brings everything together. This is what takes and pulls in those attributes from the XML 
and stuffs them and sets the properties of these guys to that. Yeah, I would, I would have suspected that it would have said instead, which it doesn't, R dot MZ, but no. I would have hoped that it would have been smart enough to know. No, I mean, I, I would yeah. have just thought yeah. that would be the syntax. Yeah, I, I was hoping... I was hoping that because I defined it as an attribute and because I, I set up those XML files that have been smart enough just to plug that in that attribute anyhow. But it wasn't. I, I had to explicitly write code to go and do that. So I guess it makes sense. That, that sort of gives you a little bit of independence between what's in your object on the inside and what you put as a parameter in XML. This is a process when you wanted to do that and when you wanted to pass in values from the XML. If I didn't want to pass values in from the XML, I wouldn't have to bother with any of this. Right? If, for example, I had a hard-coded size, size for the watermark, or if I did some calculation based on the image size, you know, or whatever, all right, then I wouldn't need to do this and I wouldn't need to put that namespace in the XML and I wouldn't need to create that attributes. So the last... 15 minutes or so, the assumption is that we want to pull things from the XML file and set properties in here. Because that, that seems to be a reasonable thing. Yes? Well, if you notice this constructor where I get a context and no attributes, doesn't call my method. So if, if this got instantiated via that constructor, then these would be the values that it would take. I, I mean, I, I, you know, don't let these confuse you. I could get rid of them. They're just, they're, just, they're just values I stuck in. Truth be told, they're values I stuck in when I was debugging before I was passing the attributes in. I just hard-coded something in there. Yeah, so you could have them, like, just defined up above. Right. And then set there. And then set them like yeah. Yeah, except for the fact, again, this constructor doesn't call that one, so, you know, doesn't call that, so, yeah, right. Yeah, right now, we, we talked about, we talked about a superclass as extending, uh, or, I'm sorry, a subclass as extending a superclass. In other words, it is a specialized version of that superclass, but it either does something more or it does something different than the superclass, right? In other words, if we were going to make this and it was going to act exactly like an image view, we wouldn't need to do it, right? There obviously has to be some functionality that's different in this. And so what, do you, what method do you suppose we're going to override on the image view? Any, any guesses on that? What method are we going to override? What is different about this than my ordinary garden variety image view? What method do you suppose I'm going to override? Uh, yes. Pardon me? Yes. Eh, not really. Yes. Yeah, it usually doesn't have text, right? What, what method are you yeah, what me yeah, what method on... Yeah. On draw, excellent. Because what's the difference between this and my image view? The difference is, yeah, I said the difference is the image view draws the image. My watermark image view draws the image plus puts the copyright message on top of it. All right? So it does more than what the regular image does. So, what do you think the first line of code in my overridden on draw method is? Let's see if we can play Kreskin and, and, and guess what the well, first I already, line. I already know. So. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I already know. Yeah. The first line of code is going. Code, I don't remember. Maybe it's well. 
it's going to, the, the undraw gets passed to canvas. It's going to be super. All right? Because for my souped up image view, I want to do everything that the image view draw does, whatever that is, and then I want to do something more. I don't want to do something instead of that. I want to do that and then do a little more. All right? So when I override it, if I were to just override it and not do anything, I would only then get the watermark, right? So, but I still wanted to draw the image, right? Still wanted to draw the image, but then I want to do more. And what more do I want to do? Well, I want to create my paint, set the, uh, set the color using the ARGB, so I use the, the uh, um, alpha or opacity to set it to not quite uh, solid, 200. I then set the stroke style for the, the, the paint brush, if you will. And I set the text size for the watermark size. And then I call the method on the canvas that I get passed in, draw text, and I put the words Mike Zeller's X, Y, which are the attributes that came in from the XML, right? And then P. And P is my paintbrush, which includes some things I hard-coded, like it's white, uh, it has, the alpha is 200, and so on. And some of the things come from the attribute, for example, the watermark size. All right? And so the effect of that is that we have this. If we look at the XML of this, just to kind of prove, in case you are any skeptics out there, that this was really doing what it said it's doing, notice that in the XML, the first one has a watermark size of 25, the second one has a watermark size of 35. So the second one's bigger than the first one. And the position's a little bit different uh, between the two. This one has an X and Y of 30 and 100, this one has 5 and 150. So it's a little bit lower down on that. Yeah, you know, that's always confusing. You have the layout center horizontal. Uh, where, oh, right. Right. They don't because these are my X and Y's. Right. Right. Um, that's a good question. I actually did not put that layout in? Yeah. Um, my guess is that it's something like that. It's centered within the available space, but the available space is only as wide as the picture is. That would be my guess of, of what's going on here. We run into that on web pages because it gets confusing because you say something centered, but it doesn't look centered. Well, it's centered within the available space. It's just that you're thinking the available space is the whole screen when in reality the available space might just be a small column of it. So that would be my guess about what's going on there. Yeah. All right. So the idea of this, again, is that you can take and you can extend the framework to do something custom to that. And now, again, now, now I have a component. So, I mean, if I can do one of them, I can make these as easy as I can make an image view now, simply by putting in, uh, you know, and optionally setting those parameters. And uh, if you want to use this for another project. Mm -hmm. You just have to import that, yeah. Yeah, the watermark class that's in com, Mike Zeller's photographer watermark. You'd have to import that. That sort of gets in the whole thing of packaging and deploying and all that. But, yep, yeah, that's what you'd need to do. And you 
you know, when you draw it on the canvas, something I I always wanted to play with a little bit was that, okay, what if, what if I wanted to write diagonal on the canvas? And I did that. I, it's not obvious how to do it, but you rotate the canvas. You don't rotate the text. I would have thought, oh, you draw the text on the diagonal. Oh, that's... Uh... Oh, that's weird. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Gotcha. Oh, that, that's that's kind of why. Oh, okay. That that okay. That makes sense because probably what you're doing. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to play with that. Probably what you're doing is you're doing this. You probably, we got the image like this. All right. We're going to save that. So we, we put the smiley face away there sometime. So we then go probably and have an empty canvas, or we create a new canvas, and we rotate it. Oh, we don't? Okay. All we do is canvas that's it. Right. Then we rotate it, and then we write, So now it's like that, all right? And then we probably bring that one back in, and then that gets over. I don't know. I'll have to play with that. that that's interesting. I, I did not, I did not uh, see that, but that would be, that would be cool. Yeah, because I looked for a raw text, you know. Right. I find yeah. Yeah, uh, interesting. You know, it, it's funny. Well, let's think. probably make, you know, you could probably extend canvas to a rotatable canvas if you wanted to. If, if you were wrote, if you're writing on the diagonal a lot, you could probably extend canvas and add a write text method or a draw text method uh, that accepted the text and a angle argument. <laughs> and then you could do all that stuff in one place and then go in and do that. So. Yeah. Yeah, so so if, you know, and, and that's a great thing about this is again, you know, um you look at what you're doing as far as the application and something you're doing a, a lot of times. I really had a hard time thinking of uh a good example for this. But then it just popped in my head. It's like a watermark, you know. That that's a, that's a great one. I mean, it's it's something that's not totally fictitious. I mean, you might want to do that, you know. And and the image view is pretty much what you want, but with something little on top of it. So, um, excellent. The other example we have, um, we only have 10 minutes left. Um, well, I'll bring it up and, and we'll see if there's any questions. It's straightforward enough that, that, that uh, probably won't. I'm, I'm thinking how long it will take. Probably won't take 10 minutes. What I did is I tweak the meal or uh, the tip calculator because you know that's a, a very critical thing you know being able to calculate the tips correctly uh, and what I did was I added I just want to compile photographer one time to get rid of the compile errors. I added a a a a, uh, a class of banquet. This is more like inheritance 101, right? Where where you're inheriting business logic. And what I did on this is I went in and you can put in an amount for the for that. And I have a different tip rate. If it's a banquet, it does 20%. If it's not a banquet, it does 15% if it's average. So um, this is pretty straightforward. Um, I just wanted to kind of show a different context for uh, inheritance instead of extending the framework, uh, implementing business rules. 
And what I had in the banquet is simply um, again having to duplicate the constructors for all the same reason as before because there is no no argument constructor on the meal. All right, so I had to go and, and uh, duplicate those. There's no additional attributes, but I've overridden the calculate tip function to give a different rate of tips if it's a banquet as opposed to a regular meal. Now, the other thing with this is it's an example of polymorphism because in my activity, I've declared a meal object, M. But I didn't instantiate it. Depending on when, depending on whether the checkbox is checked, I either instantiate a banquet or I instantiate a meal. Both of those are legit because a banquet is a meal. So I can instantiate a banquet and store it in the meal. I couldn't do the opposite, right? I couldn't have a reference to a banquet and instantiate a meal and put it in there, all right? But since a banquet is a subclass of meal and it, it is a meal, I can put in that reference to a meal a new banquet object. Then from here down, this function again gets called polymorphically. Because regardless of, uh, um, regardless of whether a bank was created or a meal was created, the right calc tip gets called. So when the checkbox is checked and I've made a banquet, it's calling the calc tip, uh, uh, tip on the banquet class. When the meal is uh, being created, it's calling the calc tip on the meal class. So just because it says m.calcTip with meal, it's not always calling the meals calculate tip. If it's got a banquet object in that reference variable m, then it's calling the banquet's calc tip. Uh, and again, that's an example of polymorphism. The rest of it just goes down and, and just outputs the stuff kind of like before. I essentially just re lazy, lazy sod that I am, I simply just repurposed the uh, dine-in button for a banquet button and, 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 was <laughs> and was done with this one. Uh, I didn't think there's too many carry out banquets, so I, I, uh, uh, I, I thought we didn't need that functionality anymore. Yeah, right, right, yeah. Yeah, we're having a celebration, but I'm sorry you can't stay here. Yeah, hit the road. All right. Questions or? No, I guess I didn't have any questions. Okay. Thank you.